What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bars, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP special events and masterminds for conferences and software companies so they can serve their highest level customers. Basically, they consider us their secret weapon for increasing engagement, getting more referrals, and building deeper relationships with their customers. We do them all over the country. We've hosted this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, none in Columbus, Ohio yet, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Vegas. Um, So if your company sees the value of bringing your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate, go to rise25.com and contact us. I am very excited. Today we have Dave Kalina, the co-founder of O2, which started in Columbus, Ohio in 2014. O2 is an oxygenated natural recovery drink and it was created by a CrossFit trainer and a medical doctor who were sick of unhealthy sports and energy drinks. If anyone could relate, I can for sure. It has electrolytes, natural caffeine, and added oxygen to help your body process toxins faster. I do want to talk about that. And they've gone from slinging O2, humble beginnings, out of the back of a Prius, uh, to very uh, you know environmentally friendly, to becoming a top seller at hundreds of CrossFit gyms, Whole Foods stores in Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, D.C., and Maryland, as well as Kroger's now. Dave, thanks for joining me. Hey, it's, it's great to be here. Um, and, uh, I want to go. I still have that Prius too. Do you really? Oh, cool. Yeah. You know, um, I want to go back to the Prius days. They're they're current, but they're yeah. they're, all, they're always Prius days. But it's, slinging O2 out of the back of your Prius, what did that look like? It's it's what was, uh, what was going on. It, it's exactly as unglamorous as it sounds. Um, when when we launched, and this was um, 2014, so we launched in February 2014, and it had been kind of a long time coming. Um, I left my day job. Uh, at Nationwide Insurance in 2011 yeah. with the intent to, to develop kind of like a healthier Gatorade or Red Bull. But I didn't know the first thing about the beverage industry, CPG in general, product development, whatever. Um, so it took uh, me and, and my co-founder, Dan, the physician on the team, um, about about three or four years yeah. to get the product off the ground. And so... Um, Dan never left his job. He's he's a medical doctor with with medical doctor debt. And so when we launched, it was it was really just me as a as a one man show, um, basically selling O2 out of the back of my car to anyone who would buy it. So um, I mean, you you launched in 2014, but you really have been working on it th- since 2011. And when yeah. did you get the idea that you were serious about actually pursuing that? Because it probably wasn't like, oh, the previous day, like, we should do this. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, and yeah, start yeah. it. You probably had been good. ruminating on it for a little while. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I, so I caught, <clears throat> I, I caught the entrepreneurial bug, bug around 2009. Um, my first job out of college was in corporate strategy at Nationwide Insurance. And it was a great first job. I was surrounded by a lot of really smart people. And I got to work directly with the chief strategy officer there, who was very high, high level, very accomplished guy. Um, he's a Harvard Business School grad. Used to work at McKinsey, and um, you know, sat on the C-suite at at a Fortune 100 company. Um, and I remember one day he called us all up to his office, or his secretary did. It was like his 60th birthday, and um, he took his work very seriously. I mean, Steve was a, a no-nonsense guy, but in his birthday speech, he was like, you know, I'm really proud of the work that we do here at Nationwide, but, you know, when you get to my age, you look back on things, and the stuff that really matters is what you do outside the community. Mm. And so he, he started telling us about a, um, a nonprofit charter high school that he had, he had been on the founding board of in Chicago mm. called Cristo Rey. Wow. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with Cristo Rey, it's a really cool concept where the, the Cristo Rey school will go into a very impoverished area 
and provide high quality uh, Catholic education um, to a group of nine, nine to 12 um, lower income students. And the way that they do that, um, because high quality education in general is pretty expensive, right? Um, is they have a pretty innovative job sharing program set up with the nationwides of the world, so the Jones days of the world, mm. um, where each student will uh, basically share an entry level clerical administrative job and rotate one day of the week working at, at the job. So four, st- four students will share one job and in return for the labor, the, the companies will usually pay anywhere between 28 and 32,000. So those four students automatically, you know, get seven, eight thousand dollars to apply to the cost of their tuition. And then on top of that, wow. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got involved several years ago. Chicago was the first school. Now there are 27, wow. 28 across the country. Um, and so I had uh, I'm from Cincinnati and, and was working in Columbus at Nationwide and had recently returned from um, Cincinnati where I saw an article for a Crystal Ray school coming to Cincinnati. And I, I marched up to Steve's office the following day. I was like, hey, man, you know, there's, there's one of these schools in Cincinnati now. And, you know, there's one in Cleveland. There's not in Columbus. We got to do one here, you know. And he's like, all right, I'll, I'll help you as long as you do all the work. <laughs> Very executive style. Um, and so I, I, uh, I got to be a part of, of the creation of a, wow. of a nonprofit charter high school, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. Um, and so I... I led mostly um, the initial talks with the diocese to get them on board with opening a school. It had been about 30 years since they opened a school, so this was kind of new to them. Um, and the, uh, there's a, a very standard model that the Cristo Rey Network now has in place where year one, um, you have to raise about $100,000 to finance. And you had to raise that? Yep, yep. That was my primary role was raise, raise 100 grand. Um, wow. And I'd never raised <laughs> any grand before. Um, and so I pulled together a group of friends uh, and and their friends, basically, who we meet every Wednesday night and talk about how we're going to raise this money. Mm. Um, so we ended up throwing a big event, and we had a lot of individual donors come through. Prior to that, we had a lot of corporate donors. We did a big raffle, um, and we ended up raising uh, the full 100000 in about 90 days. Holy cow. Um, which was really exciting, That's you know, for a, for a team of young professionals that didn't really have much experience in anything outside PowerPoint presentations. Um, and so that's when I sort of caught the bug. And after that, um, you know, I wanted to I wanted to stay active in the community. So I stayed active with with Krista Ray. Um, I was working long hours at Nationwide throughout all this. Um, I was also, I, I wasn't doing CrossFit yet, but I was doing like high intensity interval training and I was eating pretty clean, but I was fueling this otherwise healthy lifestyle with just a ton of Gatorade and a ton of mm-hmm. Red Bull. Yeah, and totally. So, I mean, I know that stuff is really not great for you and I still, yeah. if it's around, I'll still sure. just grab it, which right. I'd rather not, you know. But what else is there, right? I mean, there's yeah. not much else that's readily available. Um, and I've, I'd always wanted to like coconut water in theory, but I, I never really got past the taste, you know, um, and coffee's great. I drink coffee every morning, but I'm not going to drink it. I don't like drinking it in the afternoon or before a workout. No. Um, so one of the guys who I'd met through Crystal Ray actually, uh, was, was finishing his residency at Ohio state and he became a fast friend. And so he be, he became like my medical doctor buddy, you mm-hmm. know, and, and which are great to have because you can always ask them those free medical doctor <laughs> friend advice questions. Um, and so one day over drinks, I was asking him, you know, you lead a pretty similar lifestyle. Like, what do you do? Because I'm drinking all this garbage, but I, I don't know, like, what else is there? And he's like, I, I do the same thing. And so we're like, oh, well, you know, if, if you do this and I do this, there's probably a market for it. We should, we should just, you know, we should just start our own beverage company. How hard, how hard can that be, right? Famous last words, yeah. Famous last words, exactly. So that was 2010, and uh, and and we we finally launched O2 in 2014. Mm. So. Now it's not it's not that easy. No, but uh, so did Steve give you any advice on this journey so far, um, or was yeah. it just mostly yeah? Steve's, Steve's advice was don't do it, <laughs> don't don't leave your job. That's what he said. You no, know? oh yeah, for sure. Um, and and you know on paper he's absolutely right, right? Like most most businesses fail, and uh, and and especially in an, in an industry as competitive as CPG. Um, but you know I I had a I had a really good inclination that there was something there with this just based on my own personal need. 
um, and, and, and the needs of my friends. And granted, that's not, you know, sample size of 10, right? right. Um, but I, I think that usually if there's, if, if you've got a niche and can't find anybody else to scratch it, there's, there, there might be something there. So talk about the decision to leave nationwide. Is that a hard one? Is it not? Because there's a gap there, right? 2000. I want to talk about the R&D yeah. process because yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. You guys went really deep in the flavors and developing them. So I want to talk about that journey of the flavors yeah. but before getting to that. 2011, how hard is that decision? And then what, what do you, what do you thinking is going to happen in 2011? And obviously we could talk about the research, but yeah, man, those are, those are fun days for me to talk about because you, so you go to Steve's office. Really and don't, he said, don't do it. And you're like, bye. <laughs> You don't listen to him. <laughs> kind of. Um, so, so I had stopped working for Steve at Nationwide in probably 2009, 2010-ish. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had gotten picked up by uh, the chief marketing officer at Nationwide on another unrelated project um, that, that he, he needed to pull, pull somebody from strategy into. And, and I was halfway decent at my job, and so he, he pulled me into it. And so um, I ended up working for him um, around 2010, I think. Um, but Steve, you know, remained a friend and, and, a, and a mentor to me. Um, but, you know, after about five years of Nationwide, I, I, I went there, particularly in corporate strategy, to learn as much as I possibly could. Because I was really, I was really intrigued by that area. It seemed like a great way to learn about business. You know, I studied business undergrad in school, but... You know, I, I didn't really, it's going to sound terrible, but I can only think of a handful of classes that really, truly taught me anything um, about business. And so that opportunity gave me a great way to learn about business quickly from some people who actually knew about it, you know, um, and a lot of exposure into Nationwide. But as I progressed through my career, you know, as a the somewhat cocky uh, 27, 28-year-old, um, I realized, well, I've, I've kind of learned everything that I probably, not everything, but, but most that I set out to learn in, in, you know, in my, type of my first job yeah, and in yeah. that type of environment. And I also knew enough about that type of environment to know that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in that type of environment. Um, so, so I learned a lot and, and I, I, I knew, you know, and importantly, I knew that I didn't want to sit in a cubicle, you know, or, yeah. or an office or just have that, just be somewhere physically every day from eight to yeah. six um that yeah. just wasn't for me how do you know it's the right time to leave because you could still probably you know do it and work on the development nights yeah. and weekends but you decide just to go cold turkey and then how do you actually survive well my my time? savings vested at five years so that was a pretty good pretty good indication it was it was time to you know if, if there was a time cap on that you know once my 401k invested fully it was like all right i can you know, I don't really have to stay here. You have a little buffer. I got a little yeah. buffer, yeah. Um, and and I looked at kind of where I was in life at the time, and I was a you know single dude um, with with no you know no real <laughs> real obligations. If I if I fell on my ass, it, you know, it's not like I don't have kids. I didn't have any mouths to feed. I didn't have a mortgage. You know, I I had a dog, and he's great, but you know, he he didn't really care if I left my job. <laughs> um, and, and so it seemed like it was the right time. Yeah. And um, that combined with what I had saved um, from Nationwide as well as, you know, I'd started sort of my, my fitness journey at the tail end of that. Uh, all those things led me to think, well, maybe I should go out on my own because, you know, if I'm going to do this, I, I probably ought to do it before I have a family uh, because it probably only gets harder um, yeah. to make that sort of decision. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, so. I noticed when you, um, when you fill out the form to, uh, for the interview, for the schedule, one of the people you mentioned was Mark Rampola, which yeah. is one of my favorite books, Hiding oh, great, Fruit. Yeah. So wonderful. anyone who hasn't listened or read that book and cause you mentioned the family and yeah, you know, that, that story is amazing. So, and he did it really well. You know, um, I was, I, I, I took notes on, on that because I'm, I'm of the age now where that's, you know, that's top of mind for me. Um, but he did that would seem like very well and it was not easy, but, yeah. but he anyone who sport. hasn't read it, the founder of Zico coconut water and, and kind of his journey. And I feel it's like, it was kind of like entrepreneur therapy listening to that. hundred, hundred percent because, you know, without a benchmark, like 
I don't know many beverage entrepreneurs, you know. And, is this and normal? I don't, is this don't know if I'm, normal? Yeah, exactly. Am I a terrible CEO, or or is this is this kind of the normal grind? Um, but it's a very illuminating book. The other one, if if you like that one, you'd probably like uh, Mission in a Bottle hmm. that was written by the founders of Honest Tea, which is another another really um, yeah. I haven't read that one. I'll have to good, check that good, one out. History. I felt Shoe Dog was also kind of a. Uh, I love yeah. Shoe Dog. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, that's therapy for entrepreneurs, yeah, right? Totally. Um, the, the, the first was, thirty years. What's that? The first thirty years of Nike, nobody talks about. You know, exactly. and those were the hardest, right? Out of the back of his trunk. Totally. You know. So we'll get to the Prius, um, but I wanted. I think it's important to talk about the R and D process with the flavors because you spent yeah. a full three years. Oh yeah. Developing these. In well, the other interesting part, Dave is. They're not normal flavors. I mean, right. if you look at the flavors, they have grapefruit ginger. I would I would never put those together just thinking right. about it. Right. And orange mango. That's, you know, still not like a common combination. Yeah. So talk about that the R and D journey a bit. Yeah. So so the so the R and D journey really started um around 2011 2012 you know we Dan and I for the longest time were just kind of spinning our wheels we knew we knew what we wanted this drink to kind of look like on paper you know we, we, we yeah we had a pretty good idea what we did knew. you want to look on paper before you developed it so because so some people paper. would say no caffeine some people would say mm -hmm. with caffeine so there's there's yep. a couple debates here so the big thing for us was we had found a, um, there was a study that was published on like Business Insider or, or one of those kind of, you know, hot, hot news sites um, that, that somebody had sent us about a, a study that was done in Korea where a bunch of researchers had gotten um, a bunch of test subjects drunk with oxygenated rice wine, oxygenated soju. Uh, and the, and the, the hypothesis was, to get all these people drunk with oxygenated alcohol, it'll clear their their bodies faster, so their BAC will return to normal quicker. Hmm. Because oxygen, basically ingested oxygen, accelerates the liver's metabolism of toxins. Hmm. And so, so they got a bunch of people drunk with oxygenated soju and a control a control group drunk with uh, uh, normal soju, and and it turns out that the people who were in the the test group recovered. 25 to 35 percent faster. Hmm. Now, this wasn't this wasn't groundbreaking in the sense that they had been they were the first ones to to realize this with respect to oxygen. There have been studies dating all the way back to 1951 that show the accelerating effects of oxygen when ingested on the liver's uh, rate of metabolism. Yeah. Of I mean, they have you know for people who are sick or maybe not sick, they have oxygen chamber, hyperbaric chambers mm -hmm. where you basically, as you probably know, you just sit in it and it's just basically supposed to be healing. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know all the research behind it, but it's probably the similar type of concept. I, mean. I don't either. You know, I, I don't spend a ton. Of, I'm not the doctor on the team, obviously. Right. Um, but, but what I do know is... <laughs> you just is play one on TV. Yeah. yeah, I just play one on yeah. TV. Um, but what I do know is there's there's a lot of pseudoscience out there too. Now I, I can't say whether or not hyperbaric chambers are, are falling into that category, yeah. but there have been oxygenated waters in the past or oxygenated sports drinks that have either been oxygenated or claimed to have been oxygenated that will claim to make you you know run faster, jump higher, perform better. When all of that, uh, all, those claims are are most definitely bullshit because drinking oxygen isn't go going to affect your your lungs or and in your aerobic capacity one bit that hasn't been our focus our focus has always been on the liver because the anatomy you know you get plenty of oxygen from the air that you breathe in terms of fueling your um you, you know your respiratory system yeah but the oxygen that's delivered to your liver which is basically a catalyst for your liver's processing of toxins yeah. mostly comes from a blood supply in the stomach which is the portal the portal system the portal vein and that blood supply that's coming from the stomach is about two-thirds of your liver's blood supply and it's only about 70 percent saturated with oxygen whereas the remaining one-third is coming from your, your 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 systemic system your heart pumping blood into your into your lungs feeding the rest of your organs that's fully oxygenated so you're not going to get any more oxygen to your liver 
by by breathing pure oxygen or or just normal air. The mm. only way to get more oxygen to your liver is by drinking it. Mm. So so we chose to focus really hard on that on that liver and that insight there because one the science made sense and two nobody else was doing it and three we found a pretty big benefit. Um, you know at the time we were mid mid twenties we were certainly affected by the dreaded hangover as much as anyone else. Um, so something that could, could get rid of that faster was pretty appealing too. But as time went on, you know, we, we started to dig into the athletic. The benefit. athletes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And that, that sort of mirrored our own evolution as, as people too. Um, You're not and, trying to help people recover from drinking too much. You're like you actually know, help people. Right. <laughs> yeah. Recover from the workouts and recover yeah. from a long day at work. But sure, recover from, you know, a night out as well as anything. Um, but there are many benefits to clearing toxins yeah. faster. So you knew you system. wanted something that was oxygenated? Yes. Okay. We did that. And we how knew- hard, just for that piece, I know there's other pieces I want to talk about, the other ingredients, but how hard did you find that was to do? Laughably it, so, hard. <laughs> so it's it's not carbonated, though. I want to make Correct. that distinction. It's not yes. carbonated, so it's not like you're pumping bubbles into it. Well, so, not not quite. So, okay. so you're right. It's not carbonated. We are pumping bubbles, just not CO2. Mm. O2. O2, right. So, so if you were to pour out a, a, a can of O2 into a glass, you'd see some bubbles, but it wouldn't have the carbonation bubbles. It wouldn't be fizzy. The bubbles wouldn't be as big. And, and if you were to taste O2, it would taste like a flat, like a flat beverage. It wouldn't taste carbonated. Mm-hmm. The bubbles are a lot smaller. But at a very high level... The process to oxygenate is very similar to the process to to carbonate. Mm-hmm. That does that make sense? Yeah, totally, totally. Because when I was reading about, it, I'm like, you know, I'm picturing when you picture when I was picturing oxygenated, I was picturing carbonation for some yeah, reason. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, yeah. Hold the can. Is that hold that up for a second? So that which one is that? This is the orange mango. Which one is more popular? You know, b- believe it or not, um, our sales are about as close to 50-50 as wow. it gets. Interesting. Um, what I find is that people will enter the brand through the orange mango flavor because that's a little bit more approachable, a totally. little bit more common, right, than yeah. say, the crazy grapefruit ginger, and, and they'll drink it, and, and they'll like it. Most yeah. people who try it too tend to really like it. And so then it's like, all right, this is pretty good. Let me try the other one. They'll See, try the grapefruit ginger, and they like that as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to need to try this. Um oxygenated you needed oxygenated and so what else did you want included so we really like the idea of oxygen um, that was kind of our what's gonna make us special and different um, we wanted a a legitimate and meaningful amount of electrolytes you know there are all kinds of drinks out there that, that claim to have electrolytes and technically they do but certainly not in a meaningful way um, Gatorade and Pedialyte are both meaningful electrolytes uh, smart water I don't I don't see the, the the content you know the meaningful meaningfulness there so we knew we wanted a lot of electrolytes um, and we had a big debate about caffeine too hmm. because initially that wasn't really in the cards and then we said you know what well it would be nice because we drank a lot of this a lot of caffeinated beverages too and so maybe we should look at it but there wasn't really like a caffeinated hybrid dr- sports and energy drink out there and we weren't sure whether or not we wanted to kind of broach that subject yeah. but at the end of the day, we're like, look, this, you know, at least we'll have a product that we make for ourselves that we like, you know. If we don't sell it all, we'll just drink exactly. it ourselves. We'll just drink it ourselves. Um, and so we decided to include it. And the nice thing about that is that it's, it's, uh, you know, caffeine is the most widely used drug in the world. Um, and so a lot of people are, gravitate to just the caffeine. Um, so caffeine, electrolytes, oxygen. We didn't want it to be over 20 calories. We didn't want it to have much sugar. And so. We, uh, we basically first, that, that was the idea on paper. And so we tried to find somebody who, um, you know, had a background in this, who could help us. We didn't really know anybody from a CPG background. We certainly didn't know any, you know, beverage entrepreneurs. Uh, we, we did some research uh, online, started to call some co-packers. The moment that we talked about oxygenating a drink, they would either laugh or hang up the phone. Why? Um, because in the in that industry, in the beverage in general, uh, 99.9% of beverages are made to keep oxygen out, because oxygen, you know, with 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 different ingredients, can be corrosive. You know, it'll it'll erode uh, many ingredients, and so um, the the industry standard is is don't oxygenate. In fact, 
get it, keep it out as much as possible. Whereas we're saying, oh, no, 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 actually put 10 times as much oxygen as normal tap water into this drink. And co-packers are, are, are basically big, um, big equipment, uh, not, not, manu- not warehouses, but the, you'll essentially rent um, line time. Yeah. You'll rent their machinery to make your beverage at an industrial level, yeah. at a 20, 30,000 case scale. And so they're set up to churn and burn and keep that line occupied as much as possible. So they're certainly not set up to, to make an oxygenated drink because nobody's making it, right? right. They're set up to make, you know, carbonated uh, Red Bull knockoffs or, you know, flat Gatorade knockoffs or whatever. We were just a very unique proposition to them. Um, and so we couldn't really get anybody to talk to us. And so after a while, we said, you know what, screw it. Let's just take this into our own hands and let's see if we can make some make a drink ourselves. And so a lot of people don't know, we rented out a small um, kitchen. There's a, there's a kitchen in the short north of Columbus. It used to be a Cajun restaurant. And Cajun food is all made in batches, which meant most of the time this kitchen went unutilized. And so we rented out a day or two of, of this kitchen when we started producing um, our, our initial, you know, our initial product out of that kitchen uh, with a bar gun and some glass bottles and some stickers. And we wanted something to sell just to test the market. And so we started selling it. And, and the drink that we made tasted absolutely awful. What was it? What was the original flavor? Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was like one of those nondescript citrus flavors. Okay. You know? um, <laughs> and, and, and the universal consensus was this tastes terrible, but it works really, really well. And, and so it's like, oh, great, awesome. They say it works because that's, that's the hard part, yeah. you know? Like taste is, is difficult too, but there are teams of food scientists and flavor houses across the country that you can hire to, to refine the taste of your product. And ultimately that's the route that we went. Um, but you know, you've got to make sure that it really works and delivers on its functional promise. That's on you, the entrepreneur. And so when, when people were, were not only buying this $5 product out of a glass bottle that tasted terrible, but buying it again and again and again, yeah. that, that's when it, we knew that it was time to go all in on this. Yeah. So talk about the flavors. So how did you come to the orange mango and grapefruit ginger? So, so once we did this small um, minimum viable product pilot uh, for a few months, um, we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, okay, look, like here's here's what we learned. We're onto something with respect to the function. You know, it probably makes sense to have more than just one flavor because that way you can have more than just one facing. You know, at a retailer, um, and we'll keep the integrity and the backbone of the product the same, but we really got to address the taste. Um, and and so we we searched for one of these one of these flavor houses that that um, we would would ultimately hire one in, in Kentucky um, that would basically come up with a, a formulation based on the direction that we gave them and make it taste good. And so we hired them at the start of 2013. They were, they were one of the few to give us the time of day. Hmm. And, and we liked that they were close and, and we liked that they were good people. Um, and we liked some of the other brands that they'd worked with in the past. And so I took what was, what was left of my savings um, and, and hired them at the start of 2013 and basically gave them the, re- the direction. Here's, here's what we want in the product. It's going to have this much caffeine, this much electrolytes. Uh, it shouldn't have any more than 20 calories. It shouldn't have any more than two grams of sugar. It's got to be all natural. So we want it to be sold at Whole Foods and we want it to have, it's going to be, oh, by the way, made with oxygenated water. So good luck with that. And oh, by the way, we want it to taste really, really good. And, and that's a tall order, especially for a drink with, we have two and a half times the electrolytes as Gatorade, which is a lot of salt and, and a lot of, it's a lot of electrolytes and electrolytes yeah. on their own taste good. It can be oh, um, yeah, overpowering. Yeah, totally. Pick up a Pedialyte. Like I don't, I don't hear many people talking about how much they like Pedialyte, <laughs> right? Um, and so, uh, and oh, by the way, we also want it to taste really crisp and very light, not heavy on the tongue and really refreshing. Good luck. <laughs> and so, so, so thankfully they, they, they took a crack at it. And, you know, I think we got our first shipment of, of, uh, samples in around probably February or March of 2013. And the way that they approached it was that they sent us a whole wide variety of, of just different flavors. 
Um, you know, we had we had a, a grapefruit ginger, we had an orange mango, we had a tropical pineapple. We we pro- we probably had a blueberry, a strawberry, you know, a, a bubble gum. I don't know, like all the kinds of random different flavors that you can imagine, with the intent to start to whittle down the focus on on the type of flavor that you want to go with. And then once we, you know, we said, okay, get rid of this. This is great, but do less flavor. Keep this, or maybe think about this. You know, we had the types of flavors that we wanted to to arrive at. And then we started to look at the uh, sweetness levels, dialing that up or dialing that down, in most cases down for us. Then we started to look at the tartness, dialing that up or down. And then we started to look at the level of flavors until finally we had a set of um, five really solid flavors that, that we could choose from to debut. And that whole process was very iterative. You know, we'd, we'd get a shipment, we'd try it, we'd write down our notes independently, then we'd, you know, tell each other what, what we liked, and then we'd, we might rope in a girlfriend or a spouse or a brother or a sister, you know, coworker, whatever, we'd have them try it. It was all just the most informal, unorganized market research you can imagine, but it worked really well. You know, um, at, at least for us, it, and it had to because we didn't have we didn't have the budget to hire a you know a, 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 a focus group um, company or, or host some primary or secondary market research. You know, and so well, your brother's also going to be like, Dave, this is horrible. I you exactly sell this yeah, stuff. Exactly. <laughs> no, when my mom tried it, I kind of underweighted her. <laughs> in, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, mom, you're going to like anything that I make. It's really sweet. Um, but, but most of the time you can, you can, if you pick the right people, you can get good feedback. Um, and so that whole process took us about nine months from start to finish. Oh. And, and when it was time to, to go, we had five to choose from and I didn't go out and raise a ton of money. You know, I had, I had only when we had those flavors finalized and developed, did I, did I go out and raise just enough money to cover the first production run? You know, as a one man show, I was, I was only going to pay myself you know, two grand a month and everything else was going to be yeah. super, super it's lean. Bootstrapped, yeah. It's super bootstrapped. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it costs twice as much money to do two flavors uh, as it does one. And it costs twice as much to do four versus two. Yeah. And so I didn't want to do one, but I couldn't it's really do It's a tough one. decision. So it was a tough decision. Because you have so, five flavors, right? So exactly. Five good ones that you've grown attached to and that people like, you know. So what do you do, right? Um, well, what we did was we 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 picked our favorites, and and we picked our favorites with some direction. I knew that that I wanted to have at least one flavor that was pretty approachable, and I also knew that I wanted to have one flavor that was unique and interesting. Yeah. And and we had we had an approachable set of flavors, and we had a an, a, an a unique and interesting set of flavors. And ultimately, we picked our favorite approachable flavor, which was the orange mango, and we picked our favorite uh, unique and interesting flavor, which was grapefruit ginger, and we ran with it. And and I, I joke to people, it's not a joke, but it's it's kind of funny. Everything has changed at O2 over the past four years except for the liquid. The liquid was the one thing that I got right at the outset. Everything else I got wrong and has changed. Um, but if you're going to pick one thing it right, it, it ought to be you know the product. So I want to talk about what went wrong. But um, <laughs> you sure we have enough time? <laughs> no. <laughs> Depends. Um, but... At what point do you think you will introduce another flavor? Uh, soon. Because yeah. you probably already have those sitting at the sideline, right? Yeah, yeah, and and you know you got to dust off, um, you got to dust some things off. Um, what may have been super hot and relevant in 2014 may not be super hot and relevant in 2018. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we get a very common request from from fans which is you know this is great we want more when are you coming out with a new flavor right and and initially you know if I would have entertained that two years ago it would have been foolish and a waste of time because I just didn't have you know the capacity to manage three SKUs um, I could only I could barely manage two it just adds more operational complexity it ties up more your cash and inventory yeah. um, but as we've grown that becomes more and more realistic, and and I, I don't think that we'll ever have yeah. you know a laundry list of of ten flavors out there. But I do think one or two more 
um, could could make some sense if done yeah. right. And yeah. whatever we do, we, we're we're trying to make sure we do it right, which is why we yeah. haven't run into something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to. Um, one of the people I interviewed, you'll have to meet and talk to um, Beatbox Beverages. Um, oh, cool. I've heard of them. Actually. Yeah, so they were on Shark Tank. They, Shark Tank. Yeah. Uh, Mark Cuban was investor, and they were. When I talked to them, he gave them that advice. Actually, they were branching out into different flavors, and they kind of uh, honed it in. Yeah. T- because it's just harder to manage. But you guys actually maybe a perfect combination because they're actually, you know, the alcohol side. So maybe <laughs> they the need a package the oxygenated natural <laughs> recovery with the beatbox beverages. I like it. So, I like it. We, we, um, could, we could at least uh, we you've could heard it here first for some so entertaining stories. <laughs> um, so you have you said you, you got everything wrong, everything else wrong. But I mean, I know you're joking, but the talk about some of the mistakes. And um, I want to talk also after that about the initial kind of the, the evolution of selling. Right. From mm-hmm. the back of your Prius yeah. to yeah, yeah. to CrossFit gyms to whatever, but yeah, um, what were some of the mistakes that um, you've ironed out since then? Well, a big a big glaring one. I'll just go in <clears throat> chronological order with the with the highlights. Um, the, the the biggest glaring one was was actually before uh, we even launched. You know, I one of the the few intelligent things I did um, before we launched was I pulled together a, a an advisory board of people who had become. You know, very accomplished people who I'd known for years who'd become sort of mentors to me over the course of my career. Um, one guy used to be a professor of mine at Ohio State. Um, another guy, um, he was the chief marketing officer at Nationwide, who I worked for, um, and, and a few others. And we had uh, we had a meeting shortly before we launched, and we we're talking about launch plans. And you know, I'd I'd uh, after I left my job, in between leaving Nationwide and starting O2. I had started, uh, among other things, coaching CrossFit and coaching Krav Maga um, just to kind of make, make ends meet. And it was fun, you know. Um, and so one of the guys asked me, he was like, do you think, you know, maybe we should sell at CrossFit gyms? Like, you, you, you're into that scene and there seems to be a lot of them and it's grown in popularity. This is 2013. Like, what do you think about that idea? And I kind of, <laughs> that's a stupid idea. Like, who's, who's going to buy who's gonna buy a drink at a CrossFit gym, please? Like, I go in with my water bottle and my pre-made protein shake and you know I, I leave without spending a dime ha 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 um I, I couldn't have been more more wrong and and in retrospect you know now still uh, two-thirds of our business is mm-hmm. is it's from crossfit gyms um yeah. that's that's changing over time but but that's the backbone of our business yeah and i mean look at rx bar right exactly same story and and i think that you know when those guys might tell you the same thing, when I look at that now, it's so clear why that makes sense. You've got a product that really fits. You know, you've got a natural tie into that market. My background as a as a CrossFit coach, those guys I understand to be CrossFitters. Um, you've got a a extremely loyal group of 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 of, of clientele there. Um, that that are somewhat vain and talk a lot about CrossFit, right? And so there's an avenue for word of mouth. Um, it's hard for other companies to get into because there has to be a genuine tie into CrossFit. They care about what they put inside their bodies. And oh, by the way, you know they've got the income to spend 120, 150 dollars a month on a gym membership. So what's three dollars for a drink, right? Um, and so it, it it there's there's a lot of reasons why that makes sense. Um, but at the time. I was. I just thought it was a stupid idea. Um, so, so that was probably mistake number one um, that uh, that sticks out. You know, another um, kind of fun anecdote is that. Uh, so when when we when we launched O2, we we did our first production run, and this was like a huge monumental deal because it's something that you know had we'd been working towards for four years, and you know we 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 raised. Uh, we raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is a monumental amount of money to us. And we raised it from from like our heroes, you know, my mentors and their friends. Yeah. And we we came out with this product. We got somebody to bottle it. It tasted great, and the can looked cool. You know, we we designed it ourselves. We thought it looked awesome. It looked okay in retrospect, but we thought it looked <laughs> awesome. And and so we did our we did our first production run, and everything was going so well like it was going great the first couple of weeks were awesome like when we when we launched 
we launched at the Arnold Sports Festival, which is this huge fitness festival. Um, huge. That takes place every year in Columbus, yeah. Ohio. I think it's the largest in the world. And brings in a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a million people into Columbus uh, for for a weekend, basically. And I had been judging the CrossFit part of that um, oh, wow. competition for for a while, and so I was I was scheduled to judge that year too. And so I knew the guy who put it on. He and I used to train together, and we became friends. And uh, and I basically conned him into sneaking me in to the Arnold uh, so that I could avoid paying a paying a booth fee um, while at the same time launching our drink among this huge group of CrossFitters. And so, so day one, the whole time, again, a stupid joke, I always joke that I'm, I was the worst judge there because the whole time I'm looking over, like, do people like my drink? I was looking over at the booth that was manned by my, my, my girlfriend at the time, not knowing whether or not anyone was, was going to be into what we had just made. But it turns out people really liked it. And, and we, they liked it so much, we went through our entire weekend supply in the first four or five hours. Wow. And so we were off to such a great start, better than we could have anticipated. Well, one day, about two weeks after we launched, um, I was—I remember I was at—I was, I was at our office, um, and our, by our office, I mean the empty room in the warehouse that uh, we stored—we stored our pallets in. And I was—I was packaging uh, shipments, our online, our online shipments, uh, packaging those to go out via USPS later that day. And we—I see a Facebook message from um, some fan come come through on my phone. It said something effective, you know. Hey guys, I really like your product. I just I just picked it up at you know my gym, and you know I'm a I, I'm an avid um, avid fan of of nutritional products, and I'm a, a close label reader too, and I come from a science background. So I wanted to ask you, how is it that you have um, 370 grams of of uh, sodium and 360 grams of potassium uh, in in your drink? Like that surely can't be right. Right, and so I see this come through, and I, you know, I was, I was trying to get all these orders out the door. So I sent a text to Dan, the doctor. I'm like, "Hey, man, somebody's got a question about the electrolyte content. Can you field this?" Um, and so he's like, "Yeah, no problem." So about ten minutes later, um, he calls me, and 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 Dan and I we never really chat on the phone. You know, it's either in person or by text. So that was my first indicator that something was wrong, and my second indicator was. When he, I pick up the phone and he's like, "Hey man, um, we need to talk. Are, are you sitting down?" And nothing ever and good like, comes after <laughs> nothing that. Nothing ever good. You never want to hear that. And I'm like, "I'm not sitting down, but I can be. Why? What's up?" He's like, "Well, you know how that guy just asked how we have 370 grams of sodium and 360 grams of potassium in O2." I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, that's because that's what's that's what's written on the side of the can on the nutrition facts panel." I'm like, "So what?" He's like, well, 370 grams of sodium would be a lethal dose of sodium. It would, would, would actually be about a pound of salt, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning we made a typo on the can. And, and these cans are not done in runs of, of 100 or, or 200. The minimum production run of a can that you can buy is 155,000 cans. And we just printed 300,000 cans because we did two of those runs. So, so we had a tremendous typo on the, in the Nutrition Facts panel, the last place that you want to have a typo. We had a giant typo on the side of 300,000 cans of O2. And so, you know, immediately, like, I, I hope you've never experienced this, I started tunneling, like tunnel vision, world crashing down. You know, and and so I, I, I certainly sat down. I remember laying down, sort of in a fetal position, crying game type of thing, um, and thinking, oh you God. know what? Well, like at, at least we got something off the ground, you know. And, and people, I was people, just thinking, you re you renamed the beverage Lethal Dose, and that's <laughs> Lethal Dose. You just go with, with like you know Red Line or you know <laughs> Killer Energy. Um, but I thought the world was over. I thought the drink was over. I thought everything was over. You know, we, we had a good run of it. People seemed to like what we made, but we screwed it up. Um, well, it, it, after I picked myself back up and, and, and called um, by far the most expensive attorney that, that I've ever encountered in my life, he's kind of the leading beverage attorney <laughs> out there. Uh, turns out people do this. People make mistakes like this all the time, okay. and which is not assuring to me still to this day <laughs> that that happens as often as it does. But at least there was something to do about it. 
number one, uh, you could just ignore it and fix it on, on the next can is what he was saying. Number two, uh, you can uh, scrap all that product and all those cans and start over. Well, ignoring was an option for us. It's not really the, the honest and transparent thing to do. Um, and scrapping it was certainly wasn't an option to us because all that cash that we had just raised was tied up in inventory. And it's like, or you could you could you could kind of sticker over it. Um, and I'm like, well, what do you mean sticker over it? Well, you could you could get basically a, a a sticker, a small you know sticker that says milligrams instead of grams, and just apply those to the cans. And I'm thinking, oh my god, how would that possibly happen? I'm like, I, I'm I've got if you drink a can, you sticker. Yeah. yeah, right. Maybe everyone comes with a sticker. Um, and so thinking this through, I'm like, well, the first two things aren't options. The third one, maybe that's an option, I guess. And so I, I, I with my tail between my legs, um, bring this problem to our advisory board and, and thankfully they didn't shoot me. Instead, they, they gave me some pretty solid advice and, and the, uh, the marketing officer on the board um, Jim had a great idea, which was, you know what, you guys are trying to make like this honest and open company and, and you're trying to do some good in the world. Why don't you guys just kind of own that mistake in a funny way? What you can do is maybe you can do like a little call out sticker that says, oops, like we screwed up. Sorry, this should be in milligrams versus grams are bad. And I thought that's perfect. Like that's exactly what we'll do. And so that's, that is exactly what we did. We made a, a small little sticker and printed off 300,000 of them that said, oops, these should be, these should read in milligrams versus grams are bad. And we applied it to the side of every single can wow. from that first production run. And what that meant was every single weekend we were in the warehouse, me and Dan, and if we could wrangle in a friend or two or a sibling or two or a significant other, um, we would. And over the course of the first nine months of the company, that's exactly how we spent our weekends. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, nobody cared. And if they did, they loved it because it was kind of a cool little anecdote. Yeah. And people thought it was funny, honestly. Um, but that was, uh, that was the first major mistake that I made was that giant misprint. But once you make a mistake like that, you, you're damn sure it doesn't happen again. You know, you know Dave, what? this has been fantastic. I want to keep going for another two hours but um we are at the top of the hour we unfortunately are. um so we didn't get to talk about the the evolution i know you guys have gotten into whole foods and kroger's yeah. and we didn't talk about some of the rapid scaling and growth that's coming up next and we didn't talk about um the team that you've built which was which is really interesting to me and we didn't talk about the packaging and going a deep dive into why the cans why not glass bottles why yeah. not plastic yeah, yeah, bottles yeah. all that stuff but for another day um this has been fantastic and yeah, um great. i want to point people towards drinko2.com um and if there are any other places on the web that we should point people towards and i'll, I'll ask you one last question which you can answer quickly because i know you have another yeah. meeting but um where else should we point people towards online um i'm gonna be going today and buying it for sure oh thank you um where else uh online i know people can get it on amazon yeah. so, What's... so check it out check us out on on amazon uh we're on amazon free prime shipping i love it um at drinko2.com it's the letter o the number two and and earlier we were talking about about that special way for people to get effectively free samples that if your audience has listened through my rantings for this much, I feel like we owe it to them. <laughs> so if they go to uh, drinko2.com forward slash try O2, you can get one can of, of each flavor um, oh. for 99 cents with free shipping. Um, so check that out. That's crazy. Uh, we just ask nobody be a jerk and try to take advantage of that one, one per person, please. Um, and if we do a round two, then maybe we'll have, uh, we'll have something more for people then. Yeah, support them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so how do they get that? They go to drinko2.com slash try O2. Try O2 and then okay. enter the code sample okay. at checkout. And cool. that'll take the price from, Very I think, six ninety nine to 99 cents. So buy one and then buy it at full price after that. Um, nice. So we talked about a low point, you know, of basically mislabeling all these. What's been a high, just to end on a high point, high note, What's what's been a big milestone you're especially proud of? Well, we're, uh, we recently launched with Kroger, Kroger's division in central Ohio. 
um, which which encompasses pretty much all of Ohio and parts of Michigan ex- except for Cincinnati. And uh, and and we're right now we're the number two and number three items in our category, which That's is really amazing. exciting. Amazing. And we're we're only just getting started. Well, Dave, congratulations so far. Thank you. Uh, it's a long journey, but go to everyone go to drinko2.com and and check it out and try some. So I'm gonna be the first one, Dave. Thank you so much. Jeremy, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.